So, Dr. Bob, here's the first question. Yes. And, and if you notice uh, the quotation marks, the, the implication is that they're quoting either from the video or quoting from the word book. So at least one possibility uh, for the structure and nature of the Bible, it's its redemptive pur purpose and not a systematized rule book or doctrine book. So here's what you know we're asking. And could you please expound on that, especially on the nature and the structure of the Bible part? Yeah, I was uh, re reading it through these questions that y'all sent earlier. Uh, y'all have been reading carefully. Thank you so much for reading carefully through those notes and listening to those videos. Because these questions you ask are key points, and it allows me to uh, explain and elaborate those key points. Now, in theology, we usually call this the meta-narrative of the Bible. And what that basically means is, even though each book is an individual literary unit written by different people at different times, when you put them all together, there seems to be some themes that run through the entire Bible, no matter what book you're in. And so that's why we often say the Bible is like a library, but it has a central theme. Now, for me, and I am heavily influenced by the Apostle Paul, uh, his theology has molded my understanding of Scripture. And he really focuses on Genesis 3. Now, that may surprise you, but um, the rabbis did not focus on Genesis 3 as the origin of, of the problems in the world. They tended to focus on Genesis 6 and turn the sons of God into angels that link up with the Jude text about the angels that kept not their proper state. But Paul picks up on Genesis 3. So here is my understanding. Now, what tonight when I read these, I thought the best thing I can do is give you a special topic where I talk about this, where all the Bible verses are laid out, because I can't answer these questions in great detail. Now, the special topic that deals with this is one, you've, if you've looked at my commentaries, I put it in there over and over, and I call it Yahweh's eternal redemptive plan. It's under the Y's, of course, Yahweh's eternal redemptive plan. And it goes like this, starts in Genesis, because you cannot understand the Bible without Genesis. It, it's the framework around everything else. God created this planet for a place of fellowship. He wanted to relate to man. Now, he made us in his image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We know he wanted fellowship because in chapter 3, verse 8, it talks about him walking in the garden, the sound of him, of course. It's, a, it's a, using... Um, physical language to describe God, we call it, you know, um, anthropomorphic. But uh, then we have in Genesis 3.15, after Adam and Eve have sinned, we have this first good news. It's called proto-evangel, which means it's the first promise God made, not to Jews, because there are no Jews till at least chapter 12, or at least the end of 11 with Terah and his family. So 315 is a promise that through the woman, one is going to come that will crush the serpent's head, but in the process be bitten by the serpent. So I see God's redemptive plan. I usually put it this way to try to get people's attention. Everything from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20 is God cleaning up the mess of the rebellion of his human creatures. So I see this redemptive plan as being the link that holds all scripture together. In the Old Testament, it's looking forward to this promise. In the New Testament, it's looking back to the major fulfillment of this promise, which is the incarnation, life, and teachings of Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, the second coming is an important biblical truth, but I want to say it as strongly as I can. The Bible emphasizes the first coming. 95% of the Old Testament prophecies deal with the first coming. Our salvation is, feel, is, is uh, secured in the first coming. The main event is the first coming. The second coming is just finally consummating and cleaning up the final mess. But that's the way I look at this uh, overall redemptive plan. I hope that helps. Dr. Bob, I uh, while you were explaining, I went yeah, to I the website. It. Did you see yeah. there are the okay? Yeah, so topic, I just right. want to make sure that everybody has access to that. And That's again, the second red is, box on the homepage. 
Exactly. And it's in alphabetical order. And I'm going to list several of those tonight. So that's the first one. And the brothers, this is like, you know, we, we put these active links in the commentaries because if you've seen this thing one or two times, you don't need to see it again. But I know that people don't go to these commentaries and just sit down and read through them. That's, that's not what commentaries are used for. They're preaching or teaching on something, and they go to that chapter or that paragraph. So I've got to put those links in over again because they won't see them if I just put them in one place. And that one, I think, is really, really a crucial one. And I've listed all the biblical texts. So please do not take my word for it. Check these biblical texts. I hope in, in the answer um, allows us to get clarity over the question that was asked. And at the same time, Dr. Bob, I, I don't know if I can just insert another question that was not originally on the PowerPoint, but uh, um, yeah. So, so, so here's the question, Dr. Bob, see, see if you can, uh, maybe you can help us. Why do so many Christians have no interest in biblical studies of the Old Testament but enormous interest in prophecy and the end times. Is yeah. that related to what you just said? Well, you know, I, I, prophecy is such a difficult subject. And the reason it is, is because there's so many different opinions about it. There is no golden road for how to interpret biblical prophecy. Um, I have, it seems like that everybody wants to, you know, say, look, look how much I know. And I know more than you. And whenever that gets in, there's a problem. There's one book that has really, really, really helped me. Oh, I just tell you how much this book has meant to me. And I'm going to give you the name, and then I want to tell you why I think it's so important in this area. The man teaches at Wheaton, which is an evangelical school in Illinois. He's the New Testament uh, professor there. And the, his name is D, the initial D, period, Brent, B-R-E-N-T, Sandy, S-A-N-D-Y. His book is called, strange title, Plowshares and pruning hooks. And the subtitle is Rethinking Biblical Prophecy and Apocalyptic. Now, here's what he does. He, he finds prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament. And he, he shows how these people understood prophecy the way we do not. Uh, he quotes Joel 2, 28 through 32. And then he shows how Peter quotes that in his Pentecostal sermon in Acts 2. And everything that Joel said in Joel 2 did not happen at Pentecost. But Peter said, today this prophecy has been fulfilled. So it shows that Jews understood apocalyptic literature and biblical prophecy in a more symbolic, hyperbolic fashion than Western literalists do. So when we push prophecy too far, and I always tell people, if you misunderstand the genre and you make the Bible say more than it intends to, it is as much a sin as making the Bible say less than it intends to. And this is why my method is not mine, but it's the one I'm presenting from the ancient church at Antioch is the key is the intent of the original author. And what could the original hearers have understood? Now, there is multiple fulfillment prophecy, and I just want to touch it briefly. Um, and we don't know that until later, okay? And there's another question coming up tonight about the difference between um, typology and allegory. We'll now come back to this subject. But let's take, let's take the virgin birth of Isaiah 7, 14. Now, if you look at that in the Hebrew text, it is not the word for virgin. Now, there is a Hebrew word for virgin, but this is not it. This is the Hebrew word for a young woman of marriageable age. Now, she was expected to be a virgin or she could be stoned, but it's not the, the specific word virgin. Because if you look at Isaiah 7, this was a sign to Ahab, Ahabs, and it had to be fulfilled in that day. And if you read the text, it says before this child's old enough to know good and evil, the firebrand, which means Syria, and Israel, who was the enemy in that day, will be gone. Assyria will take them in captivity. So there had to be a historical fulfillment of Isaiah 7 in its own day. But Matthew quotes this from the Septuagint, Greek translation. It is the Greek word virgin, and we believe that Jesus was virgin born. Now, that is multiple fulfillment typology. Something happened in Israel that happens again in the life of Jesus. Take example, 
the Jews are taken into Egypt. So in Jesus' life, when he fled from Herod, his family took him to Egypt. The New Testament authors saw that as a typological fulfilled prophecy. So I, I wish I had more to say to you. This book has been so helpful to me. I think even those who claim to have a special prophetic insight, I think it's fair for me to ask them, can you show me where you got that in the Bible? Then I have the right to pray about it, study it. And it's not whether I agree or disagree, but scripture supersedes everybody's opinion in this area. Wonderful. And we're going to, we're going to get the links to those uh, references books to you guys. Um, um, as we, you know, uh, put these videos together, uploaded a Dr. Bob's or free Bible uh, lessons um, YouTube uh, page, which we invite you to go and subscribe. Uh, if you search on YouTube, free Bible commentary, just the same way that you do for the website, free Bible commentary on YouTube, you're going to see a collection of uh, Dr. Bob. I don't know how many videos are on that. On I that think there's page. 1155. Okay. I know there is over 15,000 subscribers. I know that. I just don't <laughs> yeah. know how many videos are in there. But anyways, but what we do is we record this, you know, uh, uh, Q&A time and we put them up there and right. we will offer you guys to go and visit and, and subscribe. Just remind you as, now that most of these books that I have mentioned are in the text of the seminar notebook. At the end of every section, there's a list of recommended resources and most of these books are listed there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the time in just a second, especially for those who will watch this video later. And maybe the first time that you watch the video or some of you guys connecting right now, I will take you and walk you through how to get to that seminar on the website in just a minute. I need to go to the next question. The common yes. reader, me included. Again, this is, the, this is one of our guys, one of our students, you know, asking the questions. Do not know all the idioms used in ancient times. Say, for instance, the example of jo uh, Job's wife. The word as curse, Dr. Dr. Bob uh, uh, points out, should be bliss. However, the meaning curse makes perfect sense within the context, in this case, verse 10. So how do we go about this when we read quotes from the different characters in a book? Right. Well, now the Hebrew, the key is what does the Hebrew text have? And the Hebrew text has um, bless, oh, excuse me, curse, has curse, and but Job's wife wouldn't tell Job to curse God. So in that, it's talking about bless. It's just, uh, it is an idiom. It's just like the word hate is not an idiom for hate like we use the word. It's, it's a hate for uh, choosing one you like more. Uh, you know, the two wives of Jacob, he hated one. He didn't hate her. He just liked the other one better. Now, these idioms are, are not just you have a problem. Everybody has a problem. You know, I, I like um, British crime shows. Oh, forgive me. They use words. I have no clue what those guys in England are talking about when they use some of these words because they are specific to that language and that time period. The same is true of the Bible. Many of us don't understand where these literary forms are. Now, the book that has helped me the most, and it's not a real technical book and it's not a real big book, but it's really helped me. And it's called The Language and Imagery of the Bible by G.B. Card, C-A-I-R-D. Now, he has a book on all these different kinds of, of literary issues, um, metaphors, hyperbole, Hebrew thought, and all of that's there. And so I, I commend that to you as a really good resource because um, usually if something sounds funny in a text, there's a possibility it's an idiom. But it takes some practice and it's not easy. This is where we just have to trust the translators of our modern Bible to show that to us. But as Bible teachers and preachers, we need to move behind that, if possible, to what the original word meant. And I, I would say I don't think any major doctrines hang on an idiom, just like I don't think any major doctrines hang on a grammatical feature. Uh, because these major doctrines are repeated over and over in very clear ways. We often say in hermeneutics that the Holy Spirit was a very clear writer. He, he wrote what he meant to say through these people. Now, the problem is that we've got to go back into their day and their history to fully understand that. But it was meant to be understood. It was meant to be clear. And it was understood for the most part by the people who first heard it. 
Yeah, and that was the question that there is no, uh, that they do not make any difference on major doctrines, these idioms or, no. or, or some of no. these details. Uh, what, what I want to do, uh, again, I just want to briefly show everyone on the website. This is freebiblecommentary.org, and this is how you get to the seminar. And every reference of the books that Dr. Bob is making is found at the bottom of the page as a footnote. So if you look at this red, uh, one of the red uh, windows, Biblical Interpre Interpretation Seminar, you click on that, and that's where you find the video seminars, and then you get also the notebooks and, um, and even the audio on that. So anyways, keep that in mind. Uh, those are available to you on that. Let me, let me ask, uh, before we jump into the next question, guys, um, and, and I know we're only dialoguing with us here on Zoom, but um, any questions so far for Dr. Bob, expanding or you know, uh, from everything that you have heard so far? Are we good to go? Should we move to the next one? Anybody? Good, all right. Awesome deal. Let's move into our next question. And um, on this next question, is the Psalms as a, as a poetry genre part of Western literature? That's, that's, that's kind of the question. And if the answer is yes, is it because of its structure and form? What's, what's the reason? Yes. Yes, I want to give you two special topics now because this is a rather technical subject because uh, and I'm not sure about Spanish, but in English, uh, poetry to us has a rhyme to it, a sound component. But Hebrew poetry does not necessarily have a sound component. It has a thought component, and that's confusing to us. Now, one third of the Bible is in poetry. Now, one part of the question is, how do we know it's poetry? It is very difficult in the Greek New Testament to tell the difference between poetry and what we call elevated prose. But in Hebrew, there is a certain pattern. Now, you know, Hebrew has a, um, an accent mark on the word, and these accents start having a beat to them. That's how you've probably seen cantors or rabbis at the wailing wall. When they read the scripture, they kind of bow in a rhythmic form. Well, that is this beat. And there are certain beats that tell us it's poetry. Uh, one example is a 3-2 beat is uh, very characteristic of a funeral dirge. Uh, there are other patterns that we find. So there are two special topics that I think this will be helpful. One is Hebrew poetry, where I try to explain the different kinds of parallelism. And this is a rude comment, and I, I mean it to be. If you know nothing about Hebrew parallelism, you cannot interpret the Psalms. You just can't because the lines are either saying the same thing, saying exactly opposite or building to some kind of summary. Now, if you if you're not uh, not familiar with that, you just take one line of poetry and make it say something when that's not the way that Hebrew parallelism worked. Now, the other special topic is wisdom literature. Now, there are more kinds of wisdom literature than there are just poetry. Uh, most of wi wisdom literature is kind of like parables. There can be a long parable, like a story, or a short, pithy parable. Well, wisdom literature is kind of like that. It, it, and it's very common, as you can see there on the, on the screen right now. It was not a unique genre to Israel. Israel's wisdom literature is very much like the surrounding nations. As a matter of fact, a couple of Psalms look like that Israel took some poems from other societies changed the name for God and used it as their poetry about God. So there's a lot of back and forth. It's almost like a fathers and grandfathers trying to pass on the truths about God and the world to the children around the campfires at night. They would tell stories, what happened to them. This is what their fathers told them. Wisdom literature is that way. It is very, very practical. It doesn't focus on Israel. It doesn't focus on the cultists or feast days or practices of the sacrificial system. It's not like that. It's how do we live a happy and full life? So Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs are that kind of literature. So you don't want to build a major doctrine on wisdom literature only, or you can use wisdom literature as a way to illustrate major doctrinal truths found elsewhere. One of the questions that we have um, uh, coming up right now has to do with video number nine, where, where um, you have mentioned how the word if can sometimes be translated as sins. 
Yes. Which, of course, would change the way we interpret the scriptures. Uh, yes. So the question is, me, do you have any that. examples um, sure. on your website? Yes. Yes. And let me get into that because I, man, I have, I think the, there's only two commentaries I know about, A.T. Robertson and mine, that tag every conditional sentence in the New Testament. Now, to find out about these, you'd go to Greek grammatical Greek grammar on the on the special topics. Now, if is a certain class condition. There are four classes of condition sentences in Greek. This is not my opinion. This is not your opinion. There are textual markers that absolutely clarify which one of these conditions it is. Now, the, what you're talking about is the first class conditional sentence. It is tr it is assumed the statement is assumed to be true for the literary purposes of the author. Now, it's not true to reality every time because sometimes it's used in sarcasm. But let me tell you the one that I like the most is uh, Romans 831, where it says, if God be for you, who can be against you? Well, some days the devil beats me up so bad because of what I did or didn't do. I wonder, is, is it a condition that God may not be for me? No, 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 no. That scripture is saying exactly the opposite. First class conditional. Since God is for you, who? can be against you. Now, see, that's that first class. Now, there's a second class that Jesus used a lot where he makes a false statement to accentuate a false conclusion. Um, he does that a lot, and it's very powerful. Third class condition just means potential action. It's the most common. Fourth class condition is either a prayer or a wish. Now, this is, this is not my opinion. These are marked grammatical features of the Greek New Testament. Every time one of them appears in the New Testament, I have marked it and identified it in my commentaries. Let's move into the next one on our questions. And we're going into the Bible primary gift if is the guide, not the guidelines. Knowing and following the guide until you become like Jesus is the second goal of the scripture. How do you how do we practically do that? And, and I guess the question has to do with the knowing and following him. Well, this is a great question. and I wish I had more insight on it. This is the issue of discipleship. But let me go back to say this. The goal of the Bible is not you having more information. It's not you winning Bible trivia with your in-laws. It's not you showing off to your Sunday school department. The goal of the Bible is knowing God. We, the Bible is to lead us to him, and we need to know how to please him, and that's where scripture comes in. So once we know him and we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, then he's able to teach us through scriptures what he wants us to do. Now, the, when I was thinking to this this afternoon, there's a special topic called Christian growth. And uh, I have there's four texts that talk about the different elements of Christian growth. And though it's not specific, I think it does show us and there's the Greek grammatical terms. Yeah, uh, this would be um, Christian with a C. Christian growth. Yeah, you go. Um, yeah, let's see. It's the, there it is right there. So what I've listed, it, th these different passages where, where characteristics of the man or woman who knows God is listed. And I think this gives us some idea of the goal of our lives once we know God. These kind of things are meant to characterize how we treat other people so those other people would be attracted to our God through Christ because there's a difference in us. Now, of course, this is where I think some common sense comes in here. I think Bible reading becomes very important. Uh, I think prayer becomes very important. I think worship becomes important. I think being with other Christians becomes important. I think Christian giving becomes important. I think Christian witness becomes important. All of these things are an aspect of becoming more and more like Christ. So when you read of what he did and how he worshiped and how he treated people, the Bible is meant to make us like him. The goal is to be like him, not just to have systematic theological knowledge about the Bible or even the historical understanding. Christianity is a personal relationship. It is not a ticket to heaven. It is not an insurance policy. And the longer we are Christians, the more we ought to be like him. 
We got multiple people, and I said multiple. We got a couple of guys uh, from the class that ask about this question. So yes, I, I saw is, that. Uh -huh. This is one on Ephesians five eighteen and Colossians three sixteen. Right. And they're asking if you can elaborate on yes. the filling of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, indicates it is not a once and for all experience, so right. that it is a continuous experience. Yes, most of the stuff in the Bible about the Holy Spirit is a one-time experience. I mean, talking about him wooing you and baptizing you into Christ and those kind of things, that, that's a one-time experience. But the part of the spiritual life that is ongoing is the filling. And you say, well, Bob, how did you get this? Two areas. I went to Concorda to look up the word filled. And it's used a lot of times, particularly in Acts. Uh, people are filling as a way to characterize what a person is like. You can be filled with love or filled with hate or you know, on and on. So filling is repeatable. Now, when I come to the exegesis of Ephesians, that is a present passive imperative, which means it's not an option. It's a command. It's not for special events. It's for every day. It's not something I can do, but I must allow the Holy Spirit to do it through me. So I must be available. I must open the door. I would say that the Christian life is as a supernatural event as is salvation. The spirit must lead and he is crucial, but we must open the door for salvation. We must open the door for the Christian life. So um, when I, the reason that the parallel is, is, you know, we kind of fight in the church what it means to be filled with the spirit. And so since Colossians and Ephesians are based on the same basic outline, Colossians being first and Ephesians being a cyclical letter written sometime later. In the structural parallel, not, not a word parallel, but in a structural parallel at the same point, and if you read Col uh, Colossians 3, you'll see it's exactly the same point. It says, ever be filled with the Spirit. I'm, uh, I mean, let the, let the Word of God dwell in you richly at the same place it says, ever be filled with the Spirit. Just a point before I leave. Now, this is a grammatical feature, and this is what I hope I can help you all to come to at some point. That imperative in Ephesians 5.18 is followed by five active participles. Several of them are just active and just mean continual action, but, but one of them's middle, and that middle one is be subject. And that's what's dropped. There's no verb where it says, wives, be subject to your own husband. There is no verb in the Greek text. So we're dropping down the participle from the verse before. So I would say Ephesians does not command wives to do something. Ephesians commands husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That's the only imperative for the husband. But the imperative is the main verb. Then there are five things under it. Uh, singing, psalming, making melody, be subject. Those are the way that be filling is characterized, not by Bob, not by Baptist, but by the Bible. And you can see that grammatical feature there. And in, in the outline number four, this is what we're looking for. Textual keys that help people see that we're not just giving them our opinion, but this is an aspect of the inspired text. I hope that makes sense. Definitely does. Definitely does. And again, this is the practical side of the letter of Ephesians, right? Where you find yes. this. Yes. One through three doctrinal, four through six practical. Yeah. All right. Next question. Um, this one has to do with in trying to understand the New Testament for the modern interpreter. How much do you think was from oral tradition handed down to the biblical authors and their contemporaries? And how should we yes. go about that? Well, I think that part of this question is true and part is is not. And the part of this true is I think there's absolutely oral traditions in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, I think that the early part of Genesis 1 through 11 is, was not given by God to Moses, but given by God to maybe Abraham, Isaac or Jacob. And they passed it on. It's It comes from the patriarchal period. And the reason I say that for me, the imagery of Genesis comes from Babylon, not Egypt. Now, Moses was trained in Egypt. He would have known all the mythology from Egypt, but the Genesis doesn't use that Egyptian mythology. It uses Babylonian. So I think it's oral tradition. There's another wonderful book, and I, this, this book has helped me so much. You know, I love the Bible, and there, there are some textual problems, and there are some doublets in the Old Testament, and it seems sometimes that one author says one thing and uses one name for God, and another author says something else and uses a different name. Modern literary, literary theorists have really caused problems with this. Now, there are several places I discuss this. As far as why I do not believe in the modern theory of pentatudinal source criticism, 
called the JEDP theory of Moses writings. And I hope you'll look at that. It's Pentateuchal source criticism is where that comes from. Now, there's some other topics here that I think would be helpful. Let me think for a minute. Um, yeah, the book I was thinking about is from John Walton and D. Brent Sandy. They're both at Wheaton, very evangelical school in Illinois. And their book is called The Lost World of Scripture, where they try to show us how oral societies passed on their traditions. And I think some of the problems in the Old Testament have to do with these different oral traditions. And here's where we got to trust the Holy Spirit to kind of give us truth. Now, we got to remember, and I, one of the other questions will come to it, but brothers, when we talk about inspiration and illumination, we are making faith-based statements. These are assumptions we are making from some passages in the Bible that say the Bible is from God, like the wonderful passage in 2 Timothy 3.16. And we're drawing implications for that, but the Bible never spends time explaining that. So we believe the original authors were inspired by the Holy Spirit to communicate truth to us through their vocabulary and their life experiences. So there is somewhat difference in the vocabulary between Paul and John. And that's the issue of the human part of this. So I think we, I think we just have to deal with that. As far as the New Testament, I thank God for tradition. But I want to say to you, I think scripture trumps tradition. There's a lot of traditions, even in the early church, that I think are wrong. I do not agree with Roman Catholic sacramentalism. I don't agree with Roman Catholic um, uh, apostolic, um, you know, passing on apostolic uh, positions. A lot of that developed in the early church that has nothing in Scripture to back it up. So tradition can be helpful. How did the early church think of this text? How did the Reformation church think of this text? Fine. But... For those of us who are expository preachers and Bible interpreters, we do not go to Calvin or Zwingli or, or um, uh, Rabbi Akaba or Kimchi. No, no, no. We go back to Paul. We go back to John because we think there's where the power is in the inspired text and not in later tradition. Now, there is tradition in all of our denominations. And some of this tradition is good because it keeps us from sin. But when someone mandates it, like you must fast this often, you must pray this often at this time, you got to eat these foods. When they start doing that, even with sincere motives, they are out of scriptural evidence and out of authority, in my opinion. We're coming closer, oh, and closer look, uh, to the end. Nathan held that book up. Go back to Nathan in a minute. He's got that book. Okay. Yeah, hold that up, Nathan. See that right there? That's the lost world of uh, that's the lost world of Genesis. That's another one of John Walton's books. It's a series of the lost world of. I love that book on Genesis, and you'll like this one on the lost world of Scripture too. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, there's also there's also um, the lost world of Genesis three, and the lost world of the flood. And Adam and Eve. Lost yeah. world of Adam and Eve too. Yeah. Yeah. All My by John favorite Walton. one though is uh, he's got one called. Genesis 1, and ancient cosmology, which in my opinion really solved a lot of problems in the Genesis. Genesis 1, and ancient cosmology. Do you have that one, Nathan? Um, no, I don't think I have that one, but I have one that I think is similar called Ancient Near Eastern Thought and the Old Testament by John Walton. Yes, yes that's uh, he put that together. That's like a systematic theology of the ancient world. So he goes into subjects and tells you what Egypt thought or Babylon thought or Sumer thought. And so it kind of lays out uh, ancient Near Eastern mythology. And of course, there is some connection between the Bible and ancient Near Eastern mythology. Uh, it, there just is. Of course, for those of us who believe the Bible, believe the Bible was original and the rest happened after the Tower of Babel when people got away from the true traditions and made up their own. So, mm -hmm. Mm. There's just one other book I'd like to recommend as well. It's it's written by um, a lady scholar by the name of Sandra L. Richter, and it's called The Epic of Eden. Now, this wow. book, um, this book here, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, we can see it. This book here has an opening, um, uh, an introduction called The Dysfunctional Closet Syndrome, and it basically helps people put this, the story of the, of the Old Testament together. Ah. And um, basically what she says 
is she calls it the dysfunctional closet syndrome. And the reason why she says that most people don't know how to understand the whole story of the Old Testament um, from Genesis to Malachi is because it's, it's akin to all the clothes just lying in a huge big pile on the floor. Nothing's on the coat hangers. Nothing's in order. You don't know where anything is. You don't know where to start. And she, she said that that's, that's kind of how a lot of new Christians uh, are struggling to understand what the Old Testament story actually means. Yeah. And so she puts some structure on it right. uh, um, from the opening chapter. And she really goes into an awful lot of the, the ancient Hebrew, uh, the ancient Hebraic cultural mindset and discussing the mindset of the ancient world in the ancient Near East. And it's very, very helpful. So I'd, I'd thoroughly recommend it as well. I use the same imagery when I talk about revelation uh, in time events, because I think it's like a family album. Somebody dropped it and all the pictures fell out. Now they're true pictures of the family, but the order's messed up. And when scholars try to put the order back together, that's when they get these crazy systems. So yeah, I, I certainly see that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. What's the next question? Because we're running out of time and I got several more. We are running out of time. So we're going to go to the next question. And this one has okay, to do it, with yeah. what do you mean when you say that this is not the world God intended it to be? Yes. Here again, I'm going back to Genesis. I think we see a, um, a the Garden of Eden as a place where God prepared for fellowship with human beings made in his image. This was meant to be a place of a health, wealth, abundance, and fellowship with God. The tragedy of Genesis 3 caused man to be run out of the Garden of Eden. So there was no pain, suffering, death, disease in the Garden of Eden. And so what we look at now is a world that's been affected by the curse of man's rebellion. So what I'm saying is people always say, if God's all powerful and all knowing and all loving, why does he let this happen? Well, the mess that the world is in is not on God's doorstep. It's on humans' doorstep. And God's letting it work out through time. And like Victor said earlier, sometimes problems we face, like these terrible hurricane canes in Central America, sometimes they shock people into seeing how shallow and frail their life is and draws them to God. So, you know, my granddaughter passed away in a wreck just last year. It was just so traumatic for my family. Everybody's saying, why? None of us understand why these terrible things happen. But what happens in life is not a sign of God's love. It's a sign that we live in a fallen world and God has allowed this to continue. But he is in the process of fixing it. And one day it will be a restoration of that fellowship of the Garden of Eden real quickly. Genesis 1 and 2 is very similar to Revelation 21 and 22. It's man and God in a garden with the animals. So I think the best imagery for heaven is a restored Garden of Eden. And I think, I think one of the questions, Dr. Bob, that people may have when they go through those experiences, and I'm thinking again of what just took place in Central America with the hurricanes, is what do you do in the, in the meantime? Well, while the Lord fixes and restores all that, well, what is the church called to do in the meantime? Yeah, I think what we do is when we face the world's problems and have a different attitude and face it differently, the world takes notice. Because I think the most powerful witness to a lost world is how Christians handle problems, disease, and setbacks. And when they see that we have a biblical worldview that's different from theirs, and that we can face these problems even, even with joy, look at Romans uh, 5, 3, and 4, uh, it makes, it's a powerful witness to the world. The little book that's helped me here is by, written by a Quaker lady from England called Hannah Whithall Smith, and it's called The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. I, I give that to people who are really struggling with circumstances because basically it says that God is with us and for us, and I believe that, so we can't let circumstances be the way we know he loves us and he's with us. Let's go to the next question, and this one has to do with... God is ultimately unknowable versus knowable in the scripture and Christ. What do you mean by in Christ? Well, what I, let me go back real quickly. And this, this is, of course, is one of the paradoxes that I list. And the unknowable comes only from one book of the Bible, and that's the book of Ecclesiastes. 
And the Ecclesiastes is a book that cult groups pull proof texts out of this book all the time because it is a sarcastic book. And basically, I think this author is saying this is what life would be like if there is no God. Now, that's, I think, the basic approach to that book. So he, he basically says we can't fully know God. We have to trust him. It's like the book of Job. Job never knows about the, the meeting in heaven. He never knows why all these things came on his family. But what he's told is you need to trust me. And so I, I think that Ecclesiastes is the same thing. So I think God is knowable in Christ because I believe that the Old Testament's inspired Matthew 5, 17 through 19. But I believe the ultimate revelation of God is not the Bible. The ultimate revelation of God is the living word. There is a whole lot that Jesus said and did that's not recorded in the New Testament. So the ultimate revelation of God, the final revelation of God, and we have all we need to know him is in the New Testament. But it's Jesus. And you can see that again in Matthew 5. When in verse 21 through 48, Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And in those series of little paragraphs, he changes rabbinical thought of his day. And he even changes Deuteronomy uh, 24, Moses teaching. Holy moly, Jesus changed Moses teaching? Yes, he did, which shows his ultimate authority over scripture. And in Mark 7, he says the food laws don't apply anymore. It's not what goes in a man that defiles him at what comes out, parenthesis, thereby negating the food law. So Jesus has authority even over the Old Testament. Revolutionary, revolutionary, definitely is. All right, next question, Dr. Bob. This one has to do with, is the popular concept of generational curse biblical? Yes, um, I'm, I'm hard pressed to give you a whole lot of good Bible answers on this because I have an opinion, but I'm not sure how much my opinion is based on the Bible. Uh, I started thinking about this in the uh, uh, Ten Commandments where it says the sins of the father are passed on to the children to the third and fourth generations. And uh, it, it seems like that familiar spirits pass through families. Um, I, I can't give you a lot of documentation from the Bible, but in my ministry, that has certainly been true. I always recommend for people who uh, adopt somebody that there needs to be a prayer, a special prayer at the beginning of that adoption practice with the family that basically says if there is any evil, any evil from the past, and Jesus' name to block that off and stop it. I think that's safe because I think there are familial spirits who move through families. Now, can I back that up a lot? No, I cannot. So let me again say a couple of things. I have done a special topic on exorcism. And in that special topic on exorcism, I've listed the five books that I trust because there's so much weird stuff in this area. And these are books that have helped me through the years. Uh, probably the most uh, helpful one is by a, a German evangelist named Coach. It's called Christian Counseling and the Occult. And you see it there on the screen. And that has really helped me because if we can explain it through a problem with medicine, a problem with marriage, a problem with mental illness, we ought to do it. There's not a demon behind every problem. But friends, there are demons. And sometimes an exorcism prayer is what's needed. And the only example we had, there's so little information in the Bible. I wish we had more. Um, Roman Catholicism is where a lot of these formulas and methods come from. But again, that's not inspired. So. Jesus said, be gone, and that did it. So in his name, we have power in his name. So I commend these books to you. They, they've been really helpful to me in this area, and I, I hope they're helpful to you. Uh, this is the next one, Dr. Bob, and this is also a very good, very good question, and this one has to do with salvation. So yeah. Paul's use of mm -hmm. uh, many metaphors for salvation, adoption, sanctification, justification, redemption, glorification, predestination, and reconciliation. Yeah. The question is, how do you reconcile them in trying to understand the concept of salvation? Well, it's a good question. Of course, I can't do it, but I give you my opinion. I remember I went to a conference of the Evangelical Theological Society one time, and they had a, they had a man speaking, and here's the title of, the, of the, his uh, sermon. 
is C.S. Lewis a Christian? I thought, holy moly, that is so crazy. I'm going to go just see what this fool says. And what he was bothered about, C.S. Lewis didn't like one of those one of those metaphors. I don't know why he didn't like one. And this guy said, you can't be a Christian and reject one of these metaphors. This imagery is coming from different areas in life to help different kind of people understand this. I, I would say this is a diamond with many facets. You can't pick one facet you like. It's a diamond. And the diamond is salvation. And all these different things, some from the slave world, some from the law court, uh, some from the marketplace, some from the temple. This, this is all imagery from different parts of life to show how Jesus radically impacts uh, people's relationship to God. Great. Um, Dr. Bob, just a quick follow-up question okay. uh, on the same topic. And the question is, do you have any training materials for evangelism? What would you say is the minimum a person must believe to receive eternal life? Great. Yeah, you did listen to my deal because that professor asked me that in seminary. Now, I'm a little reluctant to tell you what I think because it doesn't really matter what I think. And here's why. You've got to think through what you think. What is the irreducible minimums of being a Christian? Would you put a certain millennial position in there? Would you put a certain Bible translation in there? Would you put a certain worship day in there? See, I think those are inappropriate. What is the basic, the absolute irreducible minimum that someone could believe and be a Christian? Now, the thief on the cross didn't have much information. The Nineveh, the city of Nineveh and, and Jonah didn't have much information. No, no, no. I think it has to do with who God is, who Jesus is, the trustworthiness of the Bible, and that he wants us to know him in a personal relationship. Now, that's where my, my bottom line comes. And when people start saying, well, and add all this other stuff, there's an ancient church father, I've forgotten his name, but he has this slogan, in essentials, unity, in peripherals, freedom, in all things, love. Now, that's a pretty good motive. Now, we might fight over what's essential and what's peripheral, but you've got to decide because I think we sometimes get into fights with people over these things that don't really matter and miss the things that really do matter. So be careful of not fighting over peripheral stuff. Dr. Bob, we have a, a quick question, a live question from New Hope. Okay. Uh, if you can open your mic and, um, and ask the question. Uh, yes, I just had a question regarding, um, and I would just want to comment from you, Dr. Bob, uh, the previous question. I just was, rem I was taken back to a situation I had uh, a desperate mother uh, needing help for a son. And they called me from Chicago. Hmm. I, and I prayed and then I, I was at, I was, what, what else can I do? And I knew of a ministry, I won't say the name, I knew a ministry that was, it's known for like deliverance ministry. So I called, I looked Google, I found out, turns out they had a campus in that neighborhood where this, this person lived. So I, I called on behalf of the mother, told them the situation. I said, is it, are you able to go help that? Apparently something demonic, whatever. And then I, I believe it was a, doc, it's a doctrinal teaching or, or um, mentality because the response of the person she told me the pastor was not available but she said uh, is he saved yeah and and I said I don't believe so and she goes well deliverance is for the saved so I don't think we can help him and I got stuck and to me I'm, I'm, I'm very different I was like uh, I just I, I asked I said, God well, what can I respond here I mean at that point, it was years ago. And then I just I just asked her. I was brought to me. I said, can I ask you a question, ma'am? I go, was the man of Gadara saved? Yeah. And she, she stopped. And she, she couldn't answer. She goes, you know what? Give me your name and information. I'll call you back. And they never did. Well, that's a good point. And uh, I would say this. I sure think it's a whole lot easier if that person knows Jesus. Because yeah. it might not be demon possession, but demon influence. But you're right. right. I think we have the right in Jesus name in the presence of evil to rebuke it in Jesus name. Now, I'm not real. I just don't do this a lot. It kind of scares me, to tell you the truth. Um, but I get nervous about deliverance ministries. But, brother, 
I think some of them are valid and needed. And everybody I've known as a pastor who did this was always ostracized by other pastors and made fun of, except when someone in their church needed some help. So I think we ought to recognize this as a valid spiritual gift. We ought to be informed enough that if worse come to worse, we must deal with it in a biblical way. And we need to be able to give some resources to family members of how they can find further information. So I hope you will go back to that special topic on exorcism. Those five books are the most sane and logical uh, explanations of this area that I've seen. I certainly believe in the demonic. I believe saved people can be damaged and their witness damaged by the demonic. And I think the reason that the demons don't show themselves more in the modern world is Satan has so many people trapped. Why show his hand? But in places where the Bible is new, I think these demons have to come out with the authority of Jesus to show uh, his message is true and powerful. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you for your question. Definitely, Brother Frank. It's good to hear from you, brother. Dr. Bob, uh, just briefly, Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark 3, 28 and 29 speaks of the unpardonable sin. Yes. Would you please make quick reference on what that means, sure. the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Yes. Uh, and if you look, there's if you look in a parallel passage Bible, the different Gospels, two of them say speak and pardonable sin is as bad as the spirit. But one of them says against the son of man. So I believe that's just me. But now, again, there's a special topic called the unpardonable sin and the sin unto death in, in my notes, in my special topics. The unpardonable sin usually refers to people like Pharisees or scribes who heard the gospel clearly and said that Jesus was of the devil or rejected Jesus. They turned light into darkness. Now, that's the unpardonable sin. I do not believe that God ever rejects people completely. But what happens when people say no, no, no over and over? A callousness grows over their own heart. And there comes a place where they can't hear the spirit of God anymore because they've said no so many times. So I'm fearful of that. But I believe it's uh, rejecting the gospel in the presence of great light. As far as the sin and the death in first John, I think it's the same deal with the false teachers. Now, not the Pharisees, but the false teachers who knew the truth, who heard the truth because they were in the church. First John 2, 18. They went out from us because they were not of us. They were in the church spreading lies they knew were lies. And that becomes the sin and the death. And John says, don't pray for them. It's like they've passed the point of no return. But I never know if someone's passed the point. So I keep praying for them that the gospel will break through and that somehow the Holy Spirit can help them see the truth and come to it. Dr. Bob, we're coming almost to the end again into our questions. And uh, we're making reference to this uh, special topic. So we hope that everyone will go and visit the web side. Why is apocalyptic literature also yeah. called a spiritual imagination? Does this definition push it uh, a bit too much? That's the question. Well, here's the question. and I, I, I can't answer this. I, just, I don't know this. When God revealed the truth to John on the island of Patmos, did he include it in the imagery or did he include the message and let John structure it the way he was used to? What I'm saying is, is Jewish um, apocalyptic interbiblical um, methodology and idioms, is that what God used to present to John? Or did God give John this message and John put it in imagery that his people, Jewish, and his day, first century, could understand? I can't answer that. So I would say that just like parables are somewhat imaginative stories, they're not history. They're true to life, but they're not an actual Fred, John, and Sally did it. The same is true of apocalyptic imagery. It's not whether this is actual. It is illustrative of truth, the struggle between good and evil. So I remember in younger days when the late great planet Earth came out and the gunships turned into the locusts in the book of the Revelation in the Vietnam War period. Well, now, see, somebody's reading the Bible with one hand and the newspaper and the other, and we just can't do it with this kind of literature. We just can't do it. So I'm not trying to in any way impugn inspiration or invalidate the trustworthiness of Scripture, but I am saying that sometimes parables, number symbolism, uh, the wild imagery of Revelation is more imaginative than historical. 
One more question, Dr. Bob, and we are going to the oh, difference I saw this one. Yeah. on how do you identify allegory from typology? Sure. That, that's a great question, biotics. and I, I want to deal with that. Now, you know that allegory is in my notebook. It, it's one of those sections under this uh, ancient method from Alexandria, Egypt. So I've listed all the examples of allegory. What allegory does, basically it started with Philo. He believes that the Greek writers and the Old Testament are inspired. He wants to find Greek philosophy in the Old Testament. And the way he does it is cut off the history, cut off the word meaning, and assign words a philosophical meaning that the original author never had. Now, that's allegory, spiritualizing. Typology is finding something that happened in the life of Israel that happened later in the life of Jesus, like Jesus going to Egypt is a, is a good example of typology. And there are many of those types that are basically, uh, they, the apostles lived with Jesus, heard him teach, and there was an echo of Old Testament uh, truth and history that they saw being repeated in the life of Jesus. That is typology. There is a special topic in the, that second red box called typology, and there is a special topic called allegoric, allegory as a special topic. Much more information there. I'm sorry we don't have longer to do these really good questions. All right. So I'm going to skip uh, the showing of those special topics, but I think everybody knows by now how to get there. So if you don't mind, take the time, go to the special topics, freebiblecommentary.org, and you guys have access to some of these references. All right, Dr. Bob, here we go. Next question. Um, has to do with um, is every poetry genre within wisdom literature? Yeah, to my, the best of my knowledge, uh, poetry in, in Hebrew has to do with this pattern. It's a thought pattern. It either is synonymous, the two lines say the same thing. It's antithetical, the two lines say exactly opposite. It's a chiasm kind of in the form of an X where the main truth is in the middle line of usually five or seven verses, or it's step parallelism where a statement is made, a further statement is made, and a conclusion is drawn. Now, it is my, it is my understanding that uh, one third of the Old Testament is poetic, including the prophets. So there are some prophetic pieces that are poetic, um, but there are other prophetic pieces that are not. So it kind of depends on the structure. This is where a good study Bible that shows you poetry. Now, the way they do it is if it's just prose, it's going to be from the left margin to the right margin, solid. If it's poetry, it's going to have a, show, a line and a lot of space. That one line and a lot of space is the way modern translations show you that they believe this is poetry. And that's where you've got to know to compare the next few lines and see if they're saying the same thing, saying the opposite thing, or building to a climactic statement. Okay, next question. We're almost done. We're almost done. And I changed the color on this one because that reminds me that we're coming to the end. Okay. Uh, if sin affects us even after salvation, how do you think the biblical authors chosen by holy men escaped, escaped it when under a special spiritual leadership called inspiration? Sure. Well, we can see the, F, the effect of sin, um, illumination with the diversity on opinions and commentaries, but not under inspiration. The Bible seems to have one unified message from several different authors. Yes. Well, first, I would say I do believe all human beings, even after salvation, are affected by sin. And I get that from Romans chapter 7 and Ephesians chapter 6. There is a struggle before salvation, but even a more intense struggle after salvation. Now, I, I'm not sure we can bring this in to the New, New Testament in, in this sense. You know, we're, it is true that the, let's just take Peter. Peter is obviously inspired, but Peter really did some stupid things. Uh, and Paul had to really fuss at him for, for doing things that just were not appropriate. All human beings do inappropriate things, but we believe, it's the faith commitment. We believe that the Holy Spirit led these authors of the New Testament to accurately record what God did and what it meant and pass it on to us. Now, that's, that's a faith commitment, um, but we all assume it. It is true today, that I, and I've said to you before, I wish I knew why so many godly, prayerful, sincere, trained men of God disagree. I, I do not understand that. Now, is it because they don't have a 
proper hermeneutical approach? Is it because there's something in their personality to, for dogmatism or showmanship? Or they have been undue affected by, by a certain denominational perspective? I just can't answer that. But all of us have to remain teachable and humble and open to more light from the Bible and the Spirit. We never arrive theologically. We're all in process. We're all seeking truth. And we all want to please God. And sometimes we disagree. So the best we can do is be honest and faithful and loving in what we believe and not demand that people agree with us. I usually say, and I think I'm going to end on this. If you think your theology is God's theology, that is the most arrogant statement anybody can ever make. All of us are broken. Through the mercy of God, he's put us back together, but we're still broken. Even called gifted modern Christians are broken. So we've got to be gentle with each other.